Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure, or good morning, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Alex Ophir. Alex did his PhD at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada with Jeff Galef. He graduated in, he got his PhD in 2004, and currently he is on faculty at Cornell University. So today, Alex will be talking to us about the um, cognitive uh, ecology of monogamy. All right, thanks, Clint. Um, all right, everyone can hear me okay? Yeah, good enough, okay, good. All right, um, so I'll just start off by saying thank you to Stephen and the other people that have worked hard to put together this uh, course. I think it's um, a really wonderful idea. It's my first time to be part of a course like this. And um, given what's going on just south of the border, um, some of my uh, um, hope and uh, faith in the degree of sentience and cognition in some of my compatriots is beginning to erode. And so it's nice to focus on these kinds of questions and look, to, look for hope in non-humans um, to some extent. Um, today I am going to talk about um, some of the work uh, that I've been doing, or at least a portion of the work that I've been doing. And in general, um, if you're not familiar with uh, some of the work I do, I'm very interested in individual differences in the neurobiology of social behavior and how those sorts of things can influence uh, decision making in reproductive contexts. And so what I'm hopefully going to do today is discuss some aspects of things like social and spatial memory and the ways in which they might influence uh, reproductive decisions um, in the form of mating tactics. Um, when you think about mating systems and mating tactics, you rarely talk or think about memory. Um, but I think that that's a pr real problem because memory, social and spatial memory, is an inherent feature of mating systems and mating decisions. And so I feel that these are really inextricably linked and I'd like to sort of talk about some of this today and um, try to test the hypothesis that things like social and spatial memory can influence the reproductive decisions that animals make. So um, I do this from this cognitive ecology framework and this is a, a term that um, I found a lot of inspiration in. Um, around 98, uh, Ruven Dukas, who I believe will be giving a talk later in this course, uh, wrote a book, um, or, or rather uh, an invited, edited and edited volume, and then he and John Ratcliffe sort of revisited that again uh, a little bit later in 2009 for a second edition, and I believe they're working on a third right now um, in one form or another. And in sort of that series of work, they introduced this idea of cognitive ecology, which is sort of an idea that uh, focuses on the ecology and evolution of cognition. And um, in this sense, we can define cognition as uh, the neuronal processes that are concerned with things like acquisition, retention, and use of information. Um, at about the same, just a little bit before the second edition was coming out, another Canadian, David Sherry, uh, wrote a really nice paper uh, which he titled Neuroecology, which really hit very similar themes in his vi vision of neuroecology. It's basically the study of adaptive variation in cognition in the brain. And both of these hit on a really important theme. And that theme is that these are approaches that um, use experimental and comparative methods um, in both the field and in the lab that um, aim to understand the effects of natural and sexual selection on cognition. Um, I should sort of take a quick side note. Um, do feel free if you have questions along the way to raise your hand or just shout out um, and ask during, during this or, or at the end, it's whatever you're, you're comfortable with. And I will repeat it if they shout it out. Yes, indeed. All right, so, so cognitive ecology provides us a bit of a framework um, and it's rooted in evolution. And so you can't talk about evolution without me uh, mentioning of course, Charles Darwin. And of course, we know um, that we're all, we should all be very familiar with his, his, his theory of natural selection, which argues that selection is shaping organisms to match the demands of their environment. 
And so if you think about it, males and females of a particular population and species are experiencing the same kinds of selective pressures uh, that their environment imposes upon them. And as a result, those pressures are going to um, uh, culminate in uh, phenotypes in which males and females are pretty similar. They're going to resemble each other. And that's why males and females of, a, of species tend to look alike. Um, but of course, Darwin was also a smart fella and recognized that, that's, that there are some exceptions. He was, uh, was not oblivious to the idea of, of sexual dimorphism. Of course, that's strong. Males and females don't always look identical. And that's sort of where the exception of uh, sexual selection came in, which uh, basically argues that in the mating context, um, the, when sexes have differential rates of reproduction, you can have um, different selective pressures that result from those differential rates of reproduction, which then have forces that, that push phenotypes to look differently. And so that's why males and females don't uh, look, look differently from one another. They, they're not identical. And so we have, um, there's no reason to uh, not extend the same kind of thought to within sex variation. And so if you think about it, in many cases, there's individual variation just in general, but within males, for example, um, there can be a lot of differential um, uh, var variation in reproductive success. And in some cases, uh, selection could actually uh, operate to promote different types of males, uh, different phenotypes that are better at facing um, different challenges in the environment. These could be social, they could be uh, ecological, and indeed they could be cognitive. And so these ecological and social contexts should uh, influence reproductive decisions. And I believe we can, one way in which you can observe that is through looking at reproductive tactics. And so behavior and the endophenotype, which is really sort of like the skin in mechanisms um, that regulate and govern behavior, should really be open to the reinforcing uh, influences of selection. And uh, in other words, behavior can propagate uh, or perpetuate reproductive success, which then will have um, uh, consequences on behavior itself. And so alternative mating tactics then have the potential to reveal uh, evidence for selection uh, in the form of decision-making phenotype. And we can see this in the brain, in the behavior, or in both. So to give you a very superficial introduction to mating systems in general, these are uh, systems, that is, there are parts that make the whole, and there are some really important elements that, that sort of can create this context. Perhaps the most important um, uh, factor in a mating system might be the distribution of resources in the world in which a population lives. And so you can imagine just sort of in this cartoon, you can have an environment where there are some rich resources and some depleted resources and variation in between. And that sort of sets the context. Um, building on that, you usually get animals distributing themselves relative to those resources. Often this is the, uh, within the sexes, there's usually a, one sex of a species that's more reproductively limited than the other based on rates of reproduction and so on. This is almost always the female, but, but certainly there are exceptions to this. But in this case, the limited sex, which I'm just gonna call females in this case, will distribute themselves relative to those resources because they have to invest quite a bit in their body condition and so on to, uh, to raise kids and so on. And the less uh, limited sex, the, the, the sex that we sort of view as competing uh, for access to those resources, will then distribute themselves in time according to those resources. Maybe it's the resources that attract the females or the females themselves. But in any case, what you'll get is a differential uh, distribution um, of uh, resources where some males will monopolize um, a good number of resources, females or the resources that attract those females, and others are sort of off on the edge um, and uh, do the best to get what they can. As you might imagine, and this is, is a, the kind of a mating system we call polygyny. It's, it's perhaps the most common in mammalian species um, and certainly very common among um, uh, uh, well, throughout mam mammals, including humans, as it, as it turns out. So 
as you might imagine, this can be energetically really, really difficult. Um, it takes a lot of energy to uh, exclude others and patrol uh, borders and so on. And so at some point along the way, the amount of effort that animals uh, have to invest in this can start to outweigh the benefits that come along with them. And, uh, and occasionally what you'll get is a shift away from trying to monopolize a lot of resources and honing it in and just monopolize less. And that can represent a shift away from polygyny toward monogamy. And this is one of the ways in which you might get the evolution of monogamy in mammals. Even still in this case, you should expect some differential uh, abilities of animals to, uh, to, to um, mate guard and, and um, uh, exclude others. And so that opens the opportunity for other males to exploit that. And so what you can get is the evolution of uh, um, alternative mating tactics where some animals are uh, cuckolding um, other uh, couples. So extra pair copulations um, versus mate guarding. And so perhaps one of the most important things that I'll just start off by talking about here is that you can think of mating systems um, as a collection of individual reproductive decisions. It is a bunch, of idea, uh, a bunch of individual decisions that the modal, the most common decision, is the one we use to label the system, but understanding that there's a lot of variation that underlies a lot of that. All right, so I work with, oh yes, in the back. Right, so the question is, is, um, is the evolution of the mating system related to the reproductive success of the individuals? Absolutely, yes. So, um, in, and, and so within this context, um, what I'm uh, saying is that um, the way to maximize reproductive success can vary. There may be a common way, and we'll get into some of this actually in just a moment, but you can uh, maximize reproductive success for some individuals um, using, say, tactic one, um, and others take a second uh, tactic, tactic two, where they can maximize reproductive success given the context that they find themselves in, whether it's um, physical, genetic, circumstantial, or whatnot. So, but absolutely, yes, the, the underlying currency is always individual reproductive success, 100% correct. So I work with prairie voles, which are, um, you, you, you may have heard of, um, and if you haven't, you'll hear about them a couple of times over, the, over this course, um, not just today. Um, I, I really like working with them for a lot of reasons. Um, when it comes to exotic animals, they are not. Um, this is the kind of environment where they live. Um, old field pastures, which can be found throughout the central US and up into Canada, east of the Rockies. Um, so they have a pretty wide distribution, but, um, uh, and they, they do like old fields, clover, uh, grasses, and that sort of thing, um, highly distributed. But one of the reasons I really enjoy working with prairie voles is not the field work you get to do with them necessarily, but um, because we know so much already there about them. So there's a very rich um, uh, literature on the behavioral ecology and um, natural history of prairie voles, thanks to people like Lowell Getz and many of his uh, students, like Betty McGuire, um, Nancy Solomon, and many others, who have done a lot of work to tell us about sort of what they do in the real world. Um, from some of this work, we've learned that they are socially monogamous, that is, they form these long-term pairs. Um, in the real world, they seem to live with one pair for uh, a long time, uh, maybe a lifetime. Um, they tend to defend relatively small territories and patrol those borders. And we know that moms and dads both take care of the kids. Um, dads will pretty much do everything moms do that they're able to do. Obviously, they can't lactate and gestate, but they, they do pretty much all the rest. And so we have this really nice uh, foundation in their natural history. Um, prairie voles also adapt very well to the lab. And so as a result, you can bring them into the lab, you can do all kinds of behavioral and um, brain experiments with them. And that's provided a lot of really nice work to sort of 
confirm a lot of these sorts of behaviors under, under laboratory conditions. And a lot of that work that you'll hear uh, Larry Young later in this course talk about has led to this idea that these variables are socially monogamous, they form these long-term partnerships, and perhaps they're a really excellent model for understanding human love and attachment. Um, and I do believe that there's a lot to that. Um, the caveat, of course, is that some of the work that sort of came before me and some of the work that I've done has known for a long period of time that not all animals form pair bonds. And so you can take a prairie ball, I don't know how well you can see this, but you can strap them with a little radio transmitter that's maybe the size of the end of your pinky, um, about a, just a little bit over a gram, and you can put them in these natural enclosures and you can walk around with a little um, antenna and a receiver and track them for a series of, of weeks and get a sense of sort of where they are in these enclosures. And when you do, what you start to see is patterns like this. Each of these shapes represents a home range of one individual. The dotted lines are females and the solid lines are males. And I've color coded them um, because what you can see is often you'll get two home ranges, a male and a female, that overlap quite a bit with one another and not much with anybody else. And that's one of the ways in which you can sort of assign pa uh, pairs in the field. In the field, you refer to these animals as residents because they live in these home ranges and they are patrolling those areas. These are established home ranges. And you can kind of equate a resident in the fields to a pair bonded monogamous animal um, in general. But not all animals do this. Some remain single um, and have much larger home ranges, which you can sort of see here, which uh, intrude into the home ranges of their neighbors. Um, rarely do they have a good high fidelity with one individual um, of, the, of any sex, much less the opposite sex. And they rarely are trapped uh, with anybody else. In other words, they're always alone. And we refer to these individuals as wanderers. These are the single non-paired, non-monogamous animals. It's worth noting that females engage in this behavior as well, which is a whole nother interesting story that I don't have time to talk about. So we have uh, residents and we have wanderers. Um, and when you look at the proportion of residents to wanderers in, um, among variables, our estimates come out to be about three quarters monogamous residents, one quarter wanderers. Other studies have sort of done similar work and the numbers are pushed around a little bit, sometimes a slightly higher proportion of residents, sometimes a little less, but they're always in the majority. They are the most common so-called bourgeois tactic. Um, now, when you talk about the bourgeois tactic, sometimes the most common tactic is the better tactic and sometimes it is not the better tactic. You have to be elite to be the less common tactic and reproductive success can outnumber. And so we wanted to ask, is there um, a relationship between um, reproductive success and residents and wanderers? And so to estimate this, what we did is we counted uh, embryos sired by residents or wanderers that lived in enclosures like this for some period of time. And what you can see in this graph is that residents had significantly more sired, resident males sired significantly more um, embryos uh, than wanderers did. Some wanderers still get parentage. You can get reproductive success being a single male, but um, by far the first pass advantage is to the residents. Now this is an imperfect measure um, because these are embryos, these are not survived offspring that have gone on to have kids of their own or anything like that. And so there are potential other caveats to the story, but I think as a first pass what this suggests is that monogamy could be favored by selection. Um, I had a graduate student um, named Tamika Blocker who got interested in the question of that, of, of our resident, are, are these variables choosing to form pair bonds or are they doing it out of obligation? And to answer this question, what she did was she took a, a male prairie bull and she put him in a box that he had access to three chambers. And in one chamber, uh, in each of these two chambers down here, she placed a sexually receptive, naive female. So these three animals are all strangers to one another. It's a male that can sort of hang out with one female or another, but the females are stuck to these two rooms. And she just let them uh, live like that for a day, 24 hours. Over the course of those 24 hours, what she found is that all the animals, all the males showed uh, preferences for one female over the other. So a preferred female or a non-preferred female. Um, and with the preferred females, uh, the males would be more side-by-side -side contact, 
grooming, cuddling, that sort of behavior. The non-preferred, if they interacted with them, they tended, in fact, they significantly were more aggressive with the non-preferred than the preferred females. So already it suggests that males are sort of showing um, a predisposition to forming uh, some kind of uh, attachment to one over the other. Keep in mind, this is the ideal situation to cheat. If you want to play the field and stay single and mate with multiple females, we've set that up. We've, we've tried to bias it to favor that kind of situation. And already we get a preference. In a second phase of this experiment, what Tamika did is she took um, each of these females and she uh, contrasted one of those females with a naive female, so a brand new female. So the male chose between the preferred female and a new female or the non-preferred female and an additional new female, okay? So we've got four females serving in this whole experiment. And in those, so this is basically a take on the classic partner preference test where you test the strength of a pair bond. And what we found it was pretty striking. Uh, when contrasting the preferred and a novel female, males showed partner preferences. When contrasting the non-preferred and the novel, there was no preferences. So what this suggests is that males, at least initially, behave in a way that's consistent with choosing to form a pair bond when given the opportunity. So in addition to having um, a lot of information about the behavioral ecology of prior, oh, sorry, is that a question? Uh, sorry, just repeat it one more time. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the question is, um, was there any uh, behaviors of the females that made males prefer one over the other, or, or were there any other factors? Um, and it's a great question. As far as we could tell, um, and we did try to look at that, it, it, it was tricky. Um, the... And this is sort of, I don't know if, this is a dynamic, right, um, that you're seeing. So you don't, it was hard for us to distinguish who's initiating this or not. But what we found, not surprisingly, is the preferred females were um, much more accepting of the male uh, advances, right? So it's not clear if the non-preferred females were resistant because males because they were resistant in the first place, or if males were more aggressive to them and that made them resistant, right? So it could have gone either way. We couldn't disentangle that, uh, that. but uh, in general, um, with, in this case, um, there was more, yeah, it, we can't draw the causal arrow, but there was more culturally pro-social uh, uh, pro behavior among the preferred and more antisocial behavior among the non-preferred. The preferred females? No. Um, well, initially, all females are a little reluctant, even when they're sexually primed, um, in terms because because they're all a little socially averse at, at some degree, but it, it passes quite quickly. And initially, the first few minutes of first contact um, of males with each female didn't seem to differ at all. Yeah. As far as we know, uh, like in the previous slide, we talked about how you set this up for like to maximize the possibility of cheating. Right. Um, do we know if, there, uh, if this species has any way of detecting it, like through smell or things like that? Yeah, so the question is, can, um, can this species detect cheating through olfactory signals and things like that? Um, I don't know the answer. Um, and, and I should note, I'm, I'm, uh, these animals do cheat on, and I, I actually misspoke. In this case, we're not necessarily setting up the opportunity for cheating. We're, we're setting up the opportunity for, um, for uh, a promiscuous mating. Um, that was my mistake. But, but I, I, I conflate that because these animals do cheat on their partners quite a bit. Um, and to my knowledge, um, we don't know if they can detect if they've been cheated on or not through any form of communicative signals. Uh, it is possible, but we don't know for sure. Um, it's something that I know several people in my lab are interested in, but no one's working on actively. Um, and I don't know if other labs are also interested in that question or not, but it's a good question that I'm just gonna say, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. No, I didn't because um, one of my postdoc advisors had already done it um, back in 2002. 
Um, and it was a little bit different. What he did is he took a female and gave her three, three males to choose from. And when he did that, what he found is that most females mated with two males and many of them mated with all three. So, and that gets to another point that I sometimes make, and since you've given me the opportunity, I will, which is I believe in my heart that when you ask who's driving monogamy in this species, it's the males, not the females. And in fact, when you look at multiple mating, we have some data on this that we're writing up right now that suggests that when females mate multiply, they actually can, they violate the so-called Bateman principle, which suggests that, um, so the Bateman principle is that males uh, can increase their reproductive success by mating multiply, whereas females either do it at a lesser rate or not at all. And our data say that no, multiple mating by females increases reproductive success in female prairie voles. And so we think that there's an interesting sex conflict going on where females actually would quote unquote prefer to not be monogamous and perhaps they're uh, helping perpetuate some of the extra paired copulations and cheating that's going on. Whereas for males, the reproductive advantage is mate guarding at some level ensures paternity for you um, and guarantees your own paternity. And so that, does that make sense? Yeah. Just a second. If anything that you say is more than five words, go to the microphone. Don't, it takes, ah. it, the people on the uh, internet can't hear you. Yes, sorry, thank you. And uh, just a follow up question, like would the three males provide resources for the female? Like if they, if she made it with the three? Well, in, in that study, it was literally just uh, set up kind of like this, where it was three boxes of males. There were no resources to provide or anything like that. Um, in our uh, study, um, that is uh, that, that's indicating that there is some uh, advantage to multiple mating by females. Um, we weren't able to track it. It was done in the field. We don't know what was being provided by what or anything like that. But good questions. All right. So, um, so, so obviously these guys are really cool, right? Um, and another thing that makes them so cool is we know a lot about the mechanisms that underlie their social behavior. Um, and this is a simple cartoon version um, of the sort of so-called um, pair bonding neural circuit. Um, and we know thanks to work uh, by people like Sue Carter, Tom Insel, Larry Young, Zhu Xin Wang, and many others, that things like oxytocin and oxytocin receptor vasopressin and vasopressin receptor, and several opioids like uh, dopamine and mu opioid receptors and things like that are all operating to sort of uh, help promote um, pair bonding behavior. Um, so um, within the pair bonding circuit, um, a lot of this has been worked out, largely Larry's work, and you'll hear him talk about it, I'm sure. But what he's found is, uh, what he and, and other colleagues have found is that you can manipulate oxytocin in the nucleus accumbens vasopressin in the ventral pallidum or in the lateral septum. And these, these uh, nonapeptides, oxytocin and vasopressin, are necessary and sufficient for inducing uh, or, or um, inhibiting pair bond formation in the prairie bowl. Um, and as it turns out, nonapeptides have a much broader role in social behavior. So it's not just about pair bonding, but it's pretty much nonapeptides, oxytocin, vasopressin, and the non-mammalian homologue versions of these are important in almost all social behaviors that you can look at in almost all vertebrate taxa, and even in some indications that it might be in non-vertebrate taxa. So these are ancient evolutionary um, uh, neurotransmitters and hormones that are important for things like social grouping um, and gregariousness in things like birds and frogs and fish and, uh, of course, mammals. And so um, for me, an, uh, Focusing on uh, oxytocin and vasopressin was sort of a no-brainer. Um, and so going back to some of the data that we, we collected in that field, original field experiment that I mentioned, we wanted to ask um, to what extent did vasopressin and oxytocin receptor expression in these pair bonding structures predict being monogamous or not monogamous, being a resident or not uh, or, or a wanderer. And so in this case, we've got oxytocin in the nucleus accumbens, or oxytocin receptor in the nucleus accumbens, or the prefrontal cortex. If the structure, if the these, these are uh, brain images sliced coronally like this, the dark structure, uh, the dark colors indicate lots of receptor in these brain parts. And um, if there's a box around it, it means that it's an area that's necessary that you can manipulate and you can either 
uh, get rid of or impose uh, pair bonding. And so um, you see that here in the accumbens, in the prefrontal cortex, vasopressin in the ventral pallidum, lateral septum, and the medial amygdala. And when we looked at all of these structures and compared residents and wanderers, uh, oh, it's cut off a little at the bottom. Um, but what you hopefully can see, these are all on the same y-axis. And what you have on the left is residents, and on the right, uh, right is wanderers, is effectively, with one exception, the nucleus accumbens here, no differences in any of these structures at all. Um, which was really sort of surprising at first. Now, I'm going to come back to this difference in the nucleus accumbens later in my talk. So for now, just put that aside. But largely speaking, the lock and key to forming pair bonds shows no individual variation in the brains of residents and wanderers, despite the behavior that they've adopted. And we think this is more evidence that suggests that males are physiologically wired to be predisposed to form bonds when those opportunities arise. All right, so clearly... You can't have monogamy if you don't form a pair bond, but I don't think that that's where the story ends. As it turns out, I think there's a lot more that could potentially explain the existence of um, uh, alternative ma mating tactics. And when you look at some of these factors, something should pop up, and that's the term distribution. Things in space, things in time all matter, and I think that it's important to consider social and spatial landscapes and how they shape mating systems. So clearly you can compare residents and wanderers and you'll see that the way they use uh, space, whether it's the number of home range overlaps they have or the size of their home ranges overall are significantly different. So that already tells us that they're using space differently. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the role of, under, of mating system and spatial memory and social memory has not really come together in a way that I think it really needs to. In fact, these two things have been largely neglected despite the fact that they really are important for one another. So imagine for a minute that you're a male prairie vole out in the world, and you are gonna really need to know something about your world. Where's your resources? Where's your food? Where's your water? Where's your shelter? But where's your most important resource? Because your most important resource is your partner, right? So knowing where she is and obviously who she is is going to matter. At the same time, knowing where your neighbors are will matter, and who your neighbors are matter, because as I mentioned, they do cheat. And so every male in this in this environment is a risk to your own paternity, and every female is an opportunity to increase your, your uh, paternity. And so we think that understanding spatial memory, associations in space, distinguishing between neighbors and knowing the identity of neighbors, and converging that information, knowing who and where your neighbors are, is all very important. And so we've started to ask questions about whether or not memory relates to mating tactics and mating systems. And I'm just going to show you a couple of experiments that sort of speak to some of this. This first one, this is a, uh, Marissa Rice, one of my current graduate students, who was very excited to have ca caught a vole that day. Um, she uh, ran a, an experiment that we're, we're just now writing up, which I thought was really nice. What she did was pretty simple. We have these outdoor enclosures. This is an overhead view. This is a side view. Basically just big fences that keep animals in keep our animals in and keep other animals out. And she basically just put a whole bunch of animals in uh, two enclosures side by side. She put the same number of females in each enclosure for a reason that I can get into later if you care, 12 females in each. And then in one context, she set up a situation where the males outnumbered the females, a high male density scenario, 18 males to 12 females. In the other, she, she reversed that um, sex ratio, eight males, 12 females. So we have a high male density and a low male density um, uh, set up. She let them live like that, just totally on their own. She, you know, she, she left them alone for about a month, came back, um, trapped them all out, brought them into the lab, and tested them in this classic test of spatial memory known as the Morris water maze. If you're not familiar with this, this is how it works. You basically take a big cattle tank, you, you fill it up with water, and you make the water mercury with some, murky with some, um, some non-toxic paint, um, you give the animal um, a bunch of visual cues. You put a little platform just under the water that the animal can't see, and you let the animal swim around. After a couple of minutes, if it doesn't find it, you show them where the uh, platform is, and you repeat this trial. Eventually, their swim patterns will go like this at the beginning, and shortly after a few more trials, what you'll find is they very quickly find that platform, and their swim pattern looks much more direct. And so what you can do is you can measure the latency, that is the time it takes to reach that platform as a function of learning over repeated trials. And you can do something kind of a little bit tricky. You can take the platform away and you can ask how much time do they spend swimming where that platform used to be to test their spatial memory. 
Now we could have predicted um, that the high male density males or the low male density males might have performed better or worse than each other in either direction, but I'll just cut to the chase and show you what we found, which was that, I don't know how well you can see this, but these dark squares here represent the high male density males, and what you see is they, they uh, show a, uh, a significant reduction in the latency to find those trials. They're learning to find the trials faster, uh, or the, the platform faster. Um, than males in a low male density scenario. Now, one point I really want to highlight here is the animals that um, we put in here were all exactly the same before we put them in there. There's no reason that these males should have had anything different than these males, okay? Um, but yet, being in this high social male environment uh, induced a faster learning rate. It also showed better spatial memory. So you remove the platform, and these high male density males found that platform, uh, or spent the time where that platform used to be uh, more. So in other words, they have better spatial learning and better, better spatial memory. And there's a few important takeaway messages, but perhaps the most important one to me is that we held spatial, in, uh, spatial complexity constant. These are highly spatially complex worlds. The only thing we changed was the social condition. And when you change that social condition, what we found was that we affected spatial memory. So the social context can impact the, the social cognition, or the, yeah, the spatial cognition. In a uh, series of other experiments, a former master student, David Zhang, and again, Tamika Blocker, did a couple of experiments looking at social recognition. Um, if you saw John Sakata's talk yesterday, you saw uh, him talk about the habituation dishabituation paradigm. We basically did the same thing. You take a male prairie vole, a, a focal animal, you put them in a box, you get them used to that box, then you expose them to a stimulus animal for a, some period of time. You take the stimulus animal away, you expose them again, and you do that repeated. And in this case, what we measured was the amount of time they spent smel smelling or investigating that uh, stimulus animal. And what you expect to see is a reduction over repeated trials of social investigation. They're learning the identity of the animal, and if they know who that animal is, then they become less interested, they be habituate, um, and they explore less. And then on test, what you can do is you can basically re-expose your animal to a new animal, and if, you're, if, you're st if your subject can tell the difference between these two individuals, you expect an increase in the amount of inspection time of this new novel animal relative to the old. And when David did this with single male prairie voles, what he found, he's exposing them now to other males, and he found exactly this relationship, which wasn't terribly surprising. But what was surprising was when he did it, when he exposed these single males to females, they didn't show that relationship at all. So for some reason, they're very attuned to male uh, identity, but in this case, not to females. And this is interesting because it actually speaks back to that last experiment where the high male density information uh, shaped the behavior and improved it. So something about single male variables, uh, the identity of other males is really important to them. Uh, you can look at this in another way. You can take the difference of the last time with the familiar and the first time with the novel and just look at the difference. And when you do that, you basically, high number means better recognition. So here again, just the same thing you just saw. Um, uh, social recognition for other males, but not females. But as I mentioned, this experiment was focused solely on single male prairie voles. And we know from partner preference tests that paired males can distinguish the difference between their partner and a stranger, because otherwise, how do you show a partner preference? But what we didn't know is do paired males show uh, an ability to distinguish other females from others? So non-partner females, other than sort of my partner, are all other females the same to me, or can I tell the difference between other females at that point? And so that's where Tamika came along and did, she basically replicated this effect and she found that single males show no recognition of others, other females, but once they form a pair, they do. So something about forming a pair bond changes the social cognition, in this case, social recognition of males. All right, so some of the preliminary evidence that I've just mentioned here suggests that things like social and spatial memory can be important for these animals and potentially could be informing mating tactics. But I think it's important to also think about the neural mechanisms that underlie some of that, and so that's where I want to pivot. Um, again, uh, I'm going to return to oxytocin and vasopressin here. 
And the pair bonding literature certainly has overshadowed a long, rich history of oxytocin and vasopressin work that came well before it that, that was all steeped in memory research, as it turns out. And as it, as it turns out, oxytocin and vasopressin are really important for various forms of learning and memory. Um, and when you look at the prairie vole brain, what you'll find is um, expression of either oxytocin uh, receptor or vasopressin receptor in many of the uh, structures that are really crucial for things like um, uh, learning and memory. So here uh, you can see the uh, oxytocin receptor in the hippocampus, an area of the brain that's synonymous with things like spatial memory and learning. Um, less common maybe the septohippocampal nucleus. Um, here's the lateral dorsal thalamus. The anterior thalamus is very important for memory. And one of my colleagues refers to this structure, the retrosplenial cortex, as the new hippocampus. So all of these structures are really, really important for var various forms of learning and memory, particularly spatial memory. And what you can see is that oxytocin or vasopressin express there, but it's also highly variable among individuals. And whenever I see variation in the brain, I get excited because that means something's happening. So what we did is we looked at um, the expression of oxytocin and vasopressin receptors in residents and wanderers uh, performing in the field. Now what I've done um, is not just looked at residents and wanderers, but I've also split out those that reproduced successfully, so the, the S's here, um, or unsuccessfully, the U's. And what you can see in every single one of these structures is the same interaction pattern over and over and over. Um, and that interaction pattern is repeatedly being driven by differences between successfully and unsuccessfully reproducing wanderers, which I think is really important. What you also see is that that um, has an inverse, the same interaction only sort of mirror imaged um, in the way they're using space. So um, the neural expression of oxytocin and vasopressin in these memory structures is predicting uh, the way animals are using space effectively to reproduce successfully. And so that got us wondering, is there something more to it? So we looked uh, a little bit into the uh, literature and asked, is there a circuit going on here? And it should come as no surprise that these um, memory structures are highly interconnected with one another. They send and receive projections to each other. But what was really interesting to me is to learn that, as it turns out, they also send and receive projections to at least two of these core so-called pair bonding neural structures. The lateral septum is one, which some memory people will say it's a memory structure. And then there's the nucleus accumbens, this reward structure, which is really important for pair bonding. And this is where I'm going to remind you of that data where we found residents and wanderers differed in their oxytocin receptor in that structure. And so what I think is happening is that these memory structures are enabling the animal to evaluate their social landscape and determine, so to speak, when is it a good time to form a bond or not? And if it's a good time to form a bond, then send that information forward using the accumbens as sort of a linchpin and maybe upregulate your oxytocin receptor and really stamp in the rewarding sensations of forming a bond. In other words, quote unquote, fall in love. Now, if the situation's bad, you should always mate and it should feel good, but just don't fall in love. Stay single and keep mating multiply, in which case I think you fall into this category. And some of my colleagues, Zhu Xin Wang and Mohamed Kabaj, have got some really nice data showing that epigenetic modification of the histones um, that contain the OTR gene show that you can manipulate those things based on um, uh, external uh, stimuli, and that increases oxytocin receptor expression in the nucleus accumbens, which then facilitates partner preferences in both males and females, suggesting that the external world can feed forward and change gene expression in that structure. So perhaps there's something going on there. All right, so presumably each male is considering the uh, identity and location of neighbors and assessing the risks to their reproductive success, which suggests that there might be two tactics or strategies going on. And how does that maybe relate to memory? Well, in a situation like this, where you've got a female, maybe a resident monogamous male, and a wanderer here, you might say, how does this vary? Well, in the case of the monogamous male, you might imagine that there's an intense pressure to have good memory, know who your neighbors are, and where they are and patrol those boundaries because a lot of your reproductive success will be wrapped up into sort of that mate guarding behavior. Now you might think this guy would never want to forget something like this, but remember their opportunities to get reproductive success are limited to opportunistic matings with other males partners. And so it may be that actually f adaptively forgetting this situation or where it occurred or how it occurred might actually advantage you so you can repeat this offense because next time this guy might not be home. <laughs>
So um, my postdoc advisor, Steve Phelps, uh, and I sort of talked about that, and he coined the term adaptive forgetting. All right, so are there two different types of brains? Well, potentially. When you do a cluster analysis, which is basically just an association of um, correlations, giving it some kind of structure, and you compare um, oxytocin and vasopressin receptor expression in pair bond structure and memory structure, um, in memory structures of the, of the resident brain, what you see is a very interesting um, structure that, that falls out. There's strong correlations between pair bonded structures and memory structures within each other. So there seems to be some coordination between these two systems that really lines up nicely. Contrast that here with the wanderer brain, and what you see is that there's no rhyme or reason. And in fact, the one thing that's going on is that way out here on the tail end is the nucleus accumbens that's pretty non-correlated with all these other structures. And remember, that's that structure that I've argued is sort of that linchpin that sort of helps coordinate these two systems. And in the wanderer brain, it appears potentially that it's just out of whack and not doing its job, potentially not allowing animals to sort of operate in a way that these guys can. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that there was a lot of cheating in, uh, within that population. So are the male residents uh, as likely to cheat uh, as the females? and uh, use this adaptive uh, memory loss for themselves as well? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question that we really want to pursue, and we're working toward trying to get at that. Um, so the short answer is I don't know the answer, um, but we are interested in doing things like we've done some modeling to model the decision of when to, when to cheat and when to not. We're, we're actually doing revisions on that paper now. Um, and uh, it's a purely model-based uh, thing, so it's, it's, we base it on some real data that we had to build in some assumptions, and what it turns out is it turns out what other individuals are doing in your environment matter, and so if more individuals are cheating, so we started to change, we, we've introduced a new term, which I haven't introduced here, which is we've got our residents and our wanderers. Well, we've split our residents into two types, what we call true residents, which are the faithful ones, and the rovers, which are the unfaithful ones. And what we find is we asked, when is, when is, it when is there an advantage to rove? And it turns out as, as the proportion of rovers in your environment, so paired cheaters goes up, you should start to rove. Um, if everybody's being faithful, stay faithful. Um, but as the risk to uh, paternity goes up among other strategies, you should start doing that. If you add wanderers in, you can be faithful a little bit longer. And if you add more females in to balance out the sex ratios, it goes back. Cheat when others are cheating, which is kind of counterintuitive to a lot of the things. And we'd really like to test that with real data to see if that works. Um, and we want to do other things like manipulate their brain and see if we can make them cheat more or less. And we're working on those things too. So stay tuned. All right. So potentially there are these two different types of brains that are regulating these kinds of behaviors. And the last question that I'll address in the remaining time I have is how do you get these different uh, phenotypes? And we think a lot of that has to do with early life social experience and development. Um, we know this is George Prunus, a graduate student of mine who will be leaving in about a month to go to a postdoc. Um, and some of the work that he has done is he characterized the um, developmental trajectories of oxytocin and vasopressin in uh, male and female prairie voles. So here uh, you've got males to the left, females to the right, oxytocin receptor on top, vasopressin receptor expression on the bottom. Each bubble is a structure that expresses um, those uh, receptors. And if they're blue, it means that they increase over development. And if they're red, it means they decrease over development. And without getting into the details, the pattern I want you to notice is that for both males and females, if oxytocin receptor changes over development at all, it's increasing and largely very similar between males and females. Vasopressin is doing a little bit of both. It's either increasing or decreasing over development. And again, not a lot of distinct sex differences. I mean, there are some subtle ones there, but largely um, changing pretty much throughout many of the similar structures in male and female brains. So what that suggests, not surprisingly, is that development is a period of intense neural plasticity, and as animals grow, their brains are changing. And that provides an opportunity for things to um, be pushed around in terms of their social, regulating social behavior. George also did something else. 
after a weaning, uh, he either continued to house animals into adulthood in standard laboratory conditions, basically a box, a shoebox sized cage with some food and water and nesting, or put them in something much larger. This is about a four foot by four foot box with something like this on each side. Um, it's very spatially and socially highly complex. And he basically uh, let the animals live like this from weaning to adulthood. And doing this, this contrast, again, you're looking at the same sort of effects of either growing up like this or this. And here what you see is if you are in an enriched uh, environment compared to this, what differences do you see? And what you see is, again, when oxytocin receptor changes due to enrichment, it's increasing. Again, not many differences between males and females. But what's really striking to me is vasopressin, if it changes, it's pretty much decreasing and males are much more sensitive to that than females. So social complexity and spatial complexity can bend the developmental trajectories of the brain in really important ways. And we know that life is variable, and there's a lot of ways in which you could bend those trajectories. And if you don't believe me, here's a nice cute little example of a male and female pair, and they disagree where the pups should live. Mom says they should be outside the nest. Dad says, no, they're not ready yet. Mom says, no, nope, take them out. Dad says, bring them back. And this goes on and on. The point that I'm making is that um, you can experience a lot of very different exp um, experiences in your life that can change the way your brain wires itself up and then leads to consequences that affect you. I'm telling you, it goes on forever. I'll just stop there. Um, so, so what we think is going on is, is that the nature of parental care you receive when you're very young or in your so-called adolescent years um, can change your developmental trajectories. And these things can interact with one another and ultimately affect the nature of your social relationships. And so uh, there's enormous potential to change your behavior and we wanted to know how early life experience could influence adult um, phenotype. And so I'm going to talk about two final experiments here. One uh, conducted by a postdoc of mine who will be leaving um, at the end of the summer for to start up her lab down at Emory, actually. Um, Aubrey Kelly, who did an experiment where we raised animals either biparentally or with just mothers. Um, and we didn't want to end it there. We wanted to do something else at it. Oh, sorry, was there a question? Okay. Uh, so do you know if uh, this species has a parental style or is it just the difference is that they're either biparental or singly raised? So in the experiment, we, we force them to either be biparental or single. In nature, you get uh, three general kinds of social organizations. Um, single mothers raising offspring alone. Um, mother-father uh, pairs with their offspring, and then a slightly larger version where it's mother-father with offspring of multiple generations and occasionally strangers living in a social group. Um, and the proportions are about a third, a third, a third. Not quite, but close. So all three of those are naturally occurring. Yeah. Um, and so we wanted to strike a ecologically relevant point. So not only did we do that, but we also thought, Lab life is really easy, isn't it, right? It's maybe boring, but you get all the food and water you need and there's, it's all right there. Real life is certainly much more challenging and there's adversity out there. And we wanted to try and just throw a little bit of that in there, a lab version of that. And so here was our solution. We gave them normal caging where they had, uh, f uh, where they had their water and their bedding in a cage. But to get food, they had to walk five feet down a tube and the food was at the end. Sometimes that tube was at a zero degree incline and sometimes it was at a 30 degree incline. So we had to make them work a little bit if they wanted to eat. Okay, bad joke. Um, so we set up a two by two design where we have what we call, it's not a perfect term, but I'm gonna refer to it as a working condition or in a non-working condition and then biparental and single uh, raised animals. And um, here's what we found. So here, prairie voles, um, prairie vole pups have these things called milk teeth that latch onto mom's nipples and don't let go. And in a non-working condition, that's not a big deal. If mom wants a little snack, she just carries the pups down with her, no big deal. But in the working condition, I don't know how well you can see this, but mom can't get up that tube. She has to go to the nest, forcibly remove the pups, leave them there, and then go eat. We found a lot of results that I can't cover right now for lack of time, but the short answer uh, of terms of how did it affect parent behavior, 
moms basically take the hit. They take care of the kids equally, whether they're in a working or a non-working context. Um, when moms are single, they slightly compensate. It's a significant but small difference to elevate the amount of maternal care they provide their pups when dads aren't available. But what was really important is this one here. Dads, um, in the working and non-working conditions, showed significant differences where non-working dads spent more time taking care of pups than so-called working dads. So effectively, interpret this difference of working and non-working to mean less paternal care, because that's what's driving the difference. And you can interpret that in a lot of ways, and I'll let you do that on your own. <laughs> so how did early life experience impact the kids? Well, it affected a lot of things. That's not a big surprise. It affected social approach, exploration and anxiety, spatial memory, social preferences, and importantly, it affected partner preferences. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of these beyond that, other than the fact to say that all of these things are crucially important if you want to be a successful prairie vole, because all of these things lead to meeting, interacting, forming pair bonds, and mating with other individuals. But I am going to focus on one of them for a minute here, social approach. So to test social approach, we let the, the pups grow up, and then we basically put them in a box, and we expose them to a stimulus animal, and we just looked at how much time it took them to approach that animal. Now, I want to focus on social approach because this is where social behavior begins, right? If you don't approach an individual, it, nothing, you know, nothing follows, right? It all starts with social approach. And so we look at that as a really important initiator of social behavior and all that follows. And when we looked at that, what we found is uh, um, male prairie voles raised in the working conditions showed significantly greater latencies um, to social approach compared to males in a non-working condition and females were unaffected. In other words, working, uh, working raised males were socially averse. So can developmental mechanisms explain this adaptive behavior? Let me take a quick side note and explain some of this uh, to set up the next bit of this. So we typically think of genotype-phenotype as a single unidirectional relationship. You have your genotype, it makes your phenotype, and that's how it is. But we know that that's not how it works these days. Social experiences, social stress, environmental stress, and so on can all feed back into the genome and actually modify the genetic architecture in a way that changes the phenotype. And so we refer to this as epigenetic modification. And there's two types of epigenetic modification in general. One is that histone um, modification that I mentioned my colleagues were working on uh, before. This is where uh, the DNA is wrapped, <clears throat> excuse me, wrapped around these histones, and if they're unwrapped, then the genes can express more readily, and if they're wrapped tightly, they can't, and you can modify how tightly that DNA is wrapped. I also want to, but what I want to focus on is DNA methylation, which happens at the level of the DNA here. So DNA methylation um, is a way of modifying the DNA by adding on a little tag, if you will, a methyl group to one of the important four base pairs of the DNA. In this case, cytosine, right? You have your cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. When cytosine is followed by a guanine, C followed by G, then adding a methyl group to this little bit here can be highly stable and you can, and can have that methyl group stay on there. And that changes the configuration of the DNA molecule. Um, and so we refer to these as CPG islands, cytosine followed by a phosphate backbone followed by a guanine. And when you can find these CPG islands throughout uh, uh, the, the DNA in, in, your, in your genome, when you find a CPG island in sort of upstream regions of a gene, early uh, promoter regions, um, or, um, or in the gene bodies, or start sites and so on, it tends to suppress gene expression. It turns off gene expression. When these CPG islands um, are methylated in the tail ends, the terminal regions of a gene, it has the opposite effect. It sort of keeps the gene going and produces more gene product. And so you can get an increase of gene products um, in these structures. All right, so you can have gene silencing areas and gene increasing areas based on DNA methylation. We looked at a few brain areas. I'm just gonna talk about one of my favorites, the lateral septum. I love this structure, it's here in purple. It's important for things like reward, emotion, memory, and social behavior, particularly things like social approach and play. And so when we looked at um, the uh, CPG islands that are available in um, the vasopressin receptor gene in this structure, Basically, we started with this, we cleaned it up, and ultimately we found 16 sites of, um, significant sites of, of entry. And of those 16, two of them uh, showed significant methylation based on the 
behavioral treatments that we ran. Um, both of them were found here in that terminal region. Here's what we found. The story is the same in both. I'll just focus on number 113, but the this, this story is the same between number 113 and number 112. Working uh, raised animals showed greater percent methylation than non-working raised animals. If you're getting more methylation in this terminal region, in this part of the brain, what you should expect, of course, is that you should get more gene expression in that part of the brain. And that's what we found. Here uh, you have the percent of methylation uh, on the y-axis and the, and the um, gene um, expression of vasopressin receptor in this structure on the y-axis. And you can see that there's a positive significant correlation. So more methylation means more gene products. Um, when you break it down by group, you see that the working raised males only show significantly more methylation than any of the other animals. Um, you can break it down this way. On the y-axis, each of these boxes is a correlation between percent methylation on the y and latency to approach on the x. So this is behavior versus methylation. And it's only the working raised males that show a positive correlation between behavior and percent methylation. And here's just to remind you what the behavior looked like, just like the gene expression. So effectively, uh, we're seeing something really interesting happening here. The lateral septum, as I mentioned, is important for a lot of behaviors, particularly in other rodents. What we find is that it's important for uh, play in and uh, social attraction. And if you uh, activate it, uh, activate vasopressin receptor, you inhibit social play. And by having more receptor, you're more likely to activate it. And so what we think we're seeing here is a situation where epigenetically increased septal V1AR, which is tied to early life social experiences due to reduced paternal care, is retarding social approach. Okay, the, do I have time? Uh, how am I? I'm good? Okay, one last quick little thing here, and then I'll finish up. One last experiment we ran, another version of early life social experience. Um, a lot went into this experiment. I'm just gonna talk about one part of it. We raised animals again, either biparentally or singly, and then at weaning, we either grouped house them or single house them. So again, a two by two design. We're manipulating sort of pre-wean and post-wean life. Um, and effectively, what we've created is a double hit of social neglect in one of our groups. In that group, uh, so, so keep that in mind. What we found is in two of the brain regions that are important for social and spatial memory, the retrosplenial cortex and the septohippocampal nucleus, we found some interesting differences. Here in the retrosplenial cortex, we found a main effect of pre-wean condition. If you were raised without dads, you had more expression of vasopressin in that brain region. If you were raised in a single housed condition after you were weaned, in other words, you don't have a social support group, um, you had increased oxytocin receptor in the septohippocampal nucleus. So these two main effects are interesting in and of themselves, but when you combine them, what it suggests is you get, when you get this double hit of social neglect, it's only those individuals that have high expression rates of both of those two structures. And that's, what's interesting to me about that is that's a partial recapitulation of that neural phenotype that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that was associated with bad wandering behavior. So um, these, this is that original data here, high levels of, ox, of, of vasopressin or oxytocin receptor in these two structures. And it's these double hit social experiences that can lead to that. And so we think that early life social experiences can actually predispose males to be bad at a particular behavior. And before you get too worried, don't, right? Not all is lost for these wanderers because as it turns out, if they, um, oops, if they, um, if they uh, raise themselves, uh, if, if they have a social support group after, um, um, if they are raised without fathers, but then have a social support group, then that can be protective. They won't def def uh, develop this phenotype. They stay low. And so one of the questions we really want to know is whether or not animals are delaying the decision to disperse and stay at the nest a little bit longer um, to, to protect their brains. That would be really interesting. We don't know the answer. All right, so let me conclude. So cognitive ecology has provided us a framework to understand uh, the evolutionary forces that shape cognitive behavior uh, in species and populations. And one of my personal heroes, Nico Timbergen, has provided us a really beautiful framework for understanding behavior at multiple levels of analysis, where he identified sort of his classic four questions, three of which I've listed here. Um, now, 
cognition, whether it's human or non-human, is truly and clearly rooted in each of these distinct levels of analysis and clearly the interactions between them. And so not surprisingly, if we want to have a deeper understanding of each level um, of cognition, we need to have a deeper understanding of each level and how they interact to understand not just how cognition works, but how it evolved. And so what I feel like I've tried to do here today is provide an example of how to approach this question uh, to understand decision making, at least in one context, in the mating context, but ultimately development mechanism and adaptive value profoundly shape all forms of cognition and behavior. And uh, we won't have a good understanding of cognition if we don't consider the constraints and pressures that have shaped it and uh, the evolutionary rules that govern the expression of this fundamental feature of behavior, that is cognition. I want to thank all the people that have contributed to the work that we've done, my fantastic lab, and, um, including dozens and dozens and dozens of wonderful, hardworking undergraduate students, my funding agencies. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and happy to talk, uh, answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Alex. Um, <clears throat> great talk. Um, I have, since I've got the, uh, I'm going to leverage my power with the microphone to ask the first question. Sure. Um, there was uh, first a comment. There was a question or, or earlier um, about do males modify their behavior with respect to females having other partners? Was that, uh, did somebody ask something like that? Okay, um, just related to that, in another species, Pennsylvanicus, yes. um, Del Barco Trio and his colleagues have shown that males will modify their investment in ejaculates based on perceived mating success of yes. the female. Yes. So there is some sort of, there's a dynamic going on there. Females mate multiply, males will adjust ejaculate size, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. So, um, yeah, so, so Javi Del Barca Trio and I actually worked together on a paper um, where, so he did it in metavoles, which are yeah. sort of the non-monogamous cousin of these guys, and showed exactly that, that there's that um, adjustment of ejaculation. And we wanted to ask if residents and wanderers showed any of that. Um, and what we found is that, as it turns out, and this speaks to the flip side of your question, which wasn't asked, but I'm glad I get an opportunity to answer it, which is what do females want? And um, and what we found is we, there's not a lot. In fact, when I started this project as a postdoc with Steve Phelps, um, I originally was looking at does sexual selection shape um, monogamy? So are females choosing monogamous males? It turns out they're not choosing much at all. Um, but they do choose a few things. And one of the things they choose is males that produce more ejaculate. So as it turns out, residents have larger testes size, larger seminal vesicles, and higher sperm count. Um, in a choice test, females prefer males that have longer anogenital distances, which is a marker of exactly those same things. And so maybe through smell, they can detect uh, the difference. So when I wrote that paper uh, many years ago, one of the reviewers is like, you're not arguing that they are choosing based on the length of the anogenital distance, are you? I said, well, maybe, <laughs> but probably not. No, it's probably some indirect measure of something else, but they can detect that in the smell, uh, scent marks or whatnot. And so females can distinguish between males that are more fertile and not, and those males tend to be those males that are residents, not wanderers, and so on. And so whether it's being facultatively changed or not, we weren't able to address, like that Javi did in that uh, really nice paper, but, uh, but there is something going on uh, in terms of what females prefer there. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, now my question. Sure. So you have residents and wanderers. Do all of the residents have a partner or do you have residents without partners? Right, no, so by definition a resident is a male that has a territory and a partner. Okay, right. so you don't have sort of in the Schuster-Wade paradigm, zero class resident males that might be dragging down the average mating success right. and making wanderers and residents sort of have equal mating success. So it's, a, I'm so, <laughs> okay. No, we haven't seen that ever. Um, 
And as in our data and the data that is out there that I'm aware of, to the question that you're asking, um, when males have territories, they also have partners. Now, obviously, there's a time lag there, and potentially they set up a, a territory and then get a partner, and we miss those opportunities. So some of that could be there, but it's, it's minimal. But I'm laughing because uh, Steve Schuster and Nancy Solomon are writing a paper right now for a, uh, re um, a research theme uh, that Nancy and I are co-editing. And in it, they are talking about, so our study, which was a limitation, um, looked at reproductive success within, of embryos. So not even a full birth cycle. They, Nancy did a study where she looked at three full cycles. And she and Steve have been working on these data, and they have data that suggests that the, over that period of longer time, the amount of reproductive success may balance out between residents and wanderers. Um, and she's been talking about that data set for a very, very long time, and I've yet to see the actual paper, but I trust both of them. And so I'm very excited to see what the nitty gritty of that paper is. But something to that point could be coming very soon. Right, so there's probably some sort of negative frequency dependence going on there. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Because I, I don't know the data. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. I mean, we found that just this month in the system we work on. Uh, it's, a, it's an orthopteran insect from New Zealand, and males have three distinct strategies. Yes. And our hypothesis was that it's a genetic polymorphism, which we've just shown, cool. and they've got equal reproductive success yeah. through paternity analysis. Yeah. And, and so, usually when you have um, stable alternative tactics, then each tactic needs to have something sustaining exactly. it, unless you have a best of a bad job situation, which is what I've been arguing is the case in the Wanderers. Right. But these new data that Steve and Nancy are bringing to light might suggest otherwise. So it's, yeah. Right. I'm excited and to see that. Best of a bad job is like a curse word to Steve and Mike Wade. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Um, next question. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting uh, presentation. Um, one thing stuck with me when I was reading uh, your papers in preparation for summer school, and it was that uh, voles in your experiments were euthanized uh, afterwards. I was wondering why was that necessary and if anything was gained by it? Um, this is a, a good and important question. Um, and I mean, the simple, and I don't mean to make it sound flip, answer is you can't look at the brain in these animals without sacrificing them. Um, and I think that there's a lot of important reasons to do this. Um, it, there, um, if we really want to understand the nitty gritty mechanisms that regulate the behaviors um, that uh, from, the, from just a general science point of view to understand the, the mechanisms that underlie cognition, or if you want to take a health perspective to look at individuals that um, have deficits. So a lot of times people will talk about how some of the mechanisms that are operating here could inform what has sort of um, gone atypical in say autistic individuals or things like that. Um, you got to conduct that work somewhere somehow and this is a potential really rich model for understanding a lot of those sorts of things. Now the work that I do isn't necessarily catered to understanding autism but it is to understand the provide a foundation of neural mechanisms that guide these natural behaviors in ways that we can understand at a better level and manipulate. And so a lot of the work we try to do is to understand more behavioral manipulations, um, but we wanna see under the hood what that does because we know those things are probably happening in a similar ways in other animals. And so I think that every scientist has to face this decision of, um, you know, what is the cost versus the benefit and is it worth it? And it's something I take very seriously. I'm actually the uh, ethics editor for the Journal of Animal Behavior. And uh, so it's a question I think about quite a bit, um, not just with my own work, but many people's work that goes through that journal. Um, and for me, this is, I, I operate at a level where I can personally sit and think, I think that this cost is worth the benefit. But, um, so, yeah, I think I'll end that there because I think that that could open up, a, I mean, we could talk days about this issue, um, but I feel like there's a lot that has been gained. We are learning, we're, there are treatments for people that are being developed out of work, similar to mine, and the work that you'll see Larry Young talk about and all of that, um, that are really improving lives in major ways.
and I think that that I think that's at least one reason why it's worth it. Great, thank you. Thanks. Great, thanks. Uh, just a quick question: Do your grad students arrive pre-shrunk, or <laughs> um, do you do that? That was yeah, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a yeah, that's a little joke on Eileen, who was a uh, RA for us and that we loved, and then she left to go do graduate work, and we never really wanted her to leave the lab, so we superimposed her okay. into little bits of most <laughs> of our lab uh, photos. Uh, so, so, yeah. Anyway. Okay. Next question. Yeah, so the, the Morris water maze data is, is really intriguing. Uh, I wonder if you have any speculation on the pathways to receptor or um, hormone modulation that might affect uh, the difference between the wander, between the 18, uh, the high density and low density male situations. That's the first question. The second question is the meadow voles um, presumably have a different uh, relationship to spatial cognition, and I wonder how that sort of cashes out with respect to the prairie voles. Yeah. Um, okay, so I want to make sure I understand both of the questions, and I might start with the second one first, which is the, the meadow vole question. And so, um, so what you said, I think, is that meadow voles um, and their relation to spatial memory is quite different relative to the behaviors that they operate. And, and, and I'll just sort of clarify for the rest of the group, I think what you're referring to is some of uh, Gollin and Fitzgerald's work, which has shown that in, in meadow voles, which is a promiscuous um, um, species, so they don't form these pair bonds, males that had better spatial memory, the claim, um, uh, sorry, males that... Um, Better spatial memory should be uh, beneficial for males because it allows them to find more females uh, more quickly and all of that. And so they did a series of experiments where they compared male and female meadow voles in, the spatial me in various spatial memory tests, not the water maze, but other mazes. And then they contrasted that usually either with a monogamous species, sometimes a prairie vole and sometimes a pine vole, um, a different monogamous cousin. And what they found is that male uh, meadow voles showed better spatial memory than female meadow voles relative to the, uh, either the prairie or the pine. Um, so there were no sex differences, as they argued, in the, in the pine voles or the prairie voles, but meadow voles showed a difference. And they argued that that helps with scramble competition and so on. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I think that there, that is certainly follows the classic... Um, uh, story that um, that spatial memory enhances mate acquisition because knowing where everything is can lead to that. In the case of prairie voles, it's interesting because I think it's ironic that we've argued the opposite. We've argued that the resident males, which are not potentially mating multiply, though the caveat that they could be cheating is actually in there. Um, whereas the uh, wanderers are uh, potentially having worse spatial memory. So it's kind of a flip. But that is not to equate wandering with multiple mating and successfully multiple mating and residents not, because we know that that's not true. So I think that there's something there. Mm -hmm. I'll also point out a study that Marissa did, um, sorry, just to get to it, where we looked at male and female prairie voles, and we found that males are, have better spatial memory than females. Um, here's the learning. Um, you can see that most of that is in the first few phases. And when you look at time looking for that um, uh, time uh, in the platform area, when you do a whole quadrant, you don't get a difference. But when you start to hone in just around the target, you start to see a sex difference there as well. Again, males better than females. And what's really cool is you also see a difference in oxytocin receptor between males and females. So the size of the hippocampus and the number of cells do not differ between males and females. But oxytocin receptor is less expressed in males than females. And the data argue that oxytocin inhibits spatial memory in the hippocampus, uh, or at least some data argue that. And so if you have less receptors, you're less sensitive to that memory inhibiting thing. Mm -hmm. So we think that there's more going on actually there alone. Um, species by species vary, I think is, is a bit. I don't know if I fully answered that second part of that question, but is yes. that good enough? No, that, that, and the that first one was, again, sorry. Uh, so you showed the big effect of higher density of males, basically augmenting spatial cognition? Uh, uh, yes. Okay, right. yes, yes. Uh, what do you think is the mechanism? Is it inhibition of oxytocin in the brains of the males that have the higher density, or how is that signal? Um, I'll tell you soon. <laughs> 
So we are doing experiments like this right now. Um, I don't know. I think that there's social feedback um, based on male competition and so on that could cause up the hippocampus is extremely plastic as well mm -hmm. and uh certainly oxytocin receptor which is highly expressed in the hippocampus as well as actually base suppressant receptor mm -hmm. in the peripheral brains um are um are expressed there and we think that potentially there's some feedback the social feedback is changing that and tweaking the efficacy of the of the hippocampus in terms of how it modulates memory um, that's a big, big question, um, but just to give you so, uh, a preview of some of the things we're doing, we're doing pretests in social uh, recognition and spatial memory, putting animals in the field and radio tracking them, and then testing them again to ask, do predispositions affect who you become and how, you, like, are you a resident or a wanderer, successful, et cetera, and or does experience affect those things, and is there a consistency? We're running that right now. We're also running right now an experiment where we've uh, created hippocampal lesions and put the animals in the field. We're trapping out our first group of that of those animals. Like right now, we've got like my student said, there's five more I can't trap. I said keep trapping, <laughs> um, and we're going to look at if lesioning a hippocampus alters those same things: reproductive tactics, reproductive success, and so on. So that's one of our ways of getting at that question. Great, thank you. Yes, next. Uh, sorry if you already covered this, but um, how high a penalty do the wanderers pay if they're caught trying to mate with uh, a resident's mate? Like, are there, is there deadly mate defending? Um, it's a question that I don't know the answer to. Um, so, in the field, that's really difficult and if not impossible to test because we can't put cameras in a box that big. I mean, that's 40 meters by 20 meters, right? and under grass and all of that. So we just don't know about those kinds of interactions. Um, in the lab, back to the ethics issue, I would be uneasy with doing things like that. You can do some, look at aggression at some level, um, but uh, we know that, in, that after a male has become pair bonded, they become highly territorial and much more aggressive to intruding males after a pair bond has been formed than before. So if you're a single male, you'll tolerate an intruder in your box. No big deal. If, you're for, if a pair bond has been formed, you become highly aggressive to that animal. And so what are the consequences of that? Well, in a box, you have to give the animal a chance. In a real world, they can escape, right? So a bite and maybe they're, they're gone. In a box, that's not natural and potentially cruel. Um, so those resident intruder tests are usually very brief and highly monitored and you wouldn't be able to assess the question that you're asking Which is what's the total actual real consequence? Um, other than you know, it's gonna happen and you'll get chased away um, So I think it's a question that I don't know how to test But I think it's a really interesting question and potentially an important one because obviously these things always come down to costs and benefits And if the costs are worth the benefits you engage in that behavior Yeah, thanks can you look at differences in survival rates? Yes. In the field, you mean? In the field. Like yeah. in this enclosure experiment. Yeah. And we've, um, and I should clarify, sometimes you lose animals in the field. They don't all survive. But we've had extremely good luck in most of our animals almost always survive. Um, and, uh, and recovery rates are really good. So wanderers don't suffer more death than residents? Death, not so much. Although if there was a tendency toward that, I would say that that's the case. Okay. But there's also a caveat to that, which is one of the other differences that we noticed physically between residents and wanderers was there's not a lot of differences. And again, this is where Nancy's data, Nancy Solomon's data and mine kind of don't line up. But we have data that suggests that wanderers weighed less um, than residents. So we think that residents had better body condition. And they also had longer you know, genital distances, which I, m I mentioned, which also typically is associated with better condition of, of sort. Nancy says that um, her data uh, that sh she has from one experiment from many years ago says slightly the opposite. Um, so it's hard to say. But if you're asking me both based on my data alone, wanderers are smaller and not so competitive, and that could lead to higher rates of death just because they're skinnier and less conditioned. But it's so hard to disentangle that. OK, next question. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you already do that, but uh do you think it could be a good idea to consider the baseline level of norepinephrine between 
wanderers and uh, resident male to understand the way they manage the exploitation, exploration, trade-off uh, they face when they are uh, choosing to focus their attention on one or on many females. Was the, did you say look at norepinephrine? Was yeah, that the question? Absolutely, yeah. Um, that's a really cool idea. Um, not with norepinephrine. We haven't looked at epinephrine or norepinephrine, adrenaline and all that, um, depending on you know, yeah, which term you prefer. Yeah. Um, but what we have uh, started to think about a little bit is corticosterone, um, more importantly, a corticotropin releasing hormone. Um, which is sort of an upstream of that. So that's associated with energy mobilization and all of that, similar to what epinephrine and norepinephrine would, would do. Um, we don't have any results on that yet, but we're beginning to ask a, a few questions along those lines. But the short answer is no, I don't have that. It, yeah, well, but, it's, it's, but it's, I think it's insightful. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I have one, another short question. In this experiment, you've yeah. manipulated... Um, population density and sex ratio. How do you tease those apart? Ah, uh, yeah, in that other experiment, yeah, yeah. right, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the one thing that we're gonna have to deal with. So, um, I s let me just go back to the picture here, um, if I can find it. So, in this experiment where we manipulated uh, sex ratio, um, yeah, population density is different. We what we probably ought to do, and I'm hoping that reviewers won't force us to do, is to redo this experiment where we keep population density the same. Um, we chose this because we wanted the number of females per unit space to be constant, because to us that was important. So the only way to keep population density the same, but, um, uh, but the sex ratio is different, is to increase the number of females. And we felt that that was something we didn't want to do because that would potentially change a different equation that we didn't want to do. So inherent, you either have one flaw or the other. Um, that's my answer to that. My hope is that we can get away with what we have now. Um, we're just finalizing the paper and we're going to submit it. So anyway, we'll see. And if we have to go back to the drawing board and redo this, then we can do it um, with that. But I think that conceptually, given that this is about space use and how animals respond to the number of females, how males respond to the social environment, ah, I don't know. It could, it could yeah, it could get complicated. Um, did you ever flip the two around and do it in another season and put the 8-12 and then the 18-12? In this one, we only ran the two enclosures and that was it, we didn't flip. In the past, we've done other experiments in these enclosures and others, and we do that. And the enclosures are effectively considered the same. I mean, they don't yeah. react anyway. That's a favorite reviewer thing to yeah, pick I on. Know. Did you I know. flip them around? Yeah, yeah. So, the, yeah. We didn't, we didn't because we only ran one treatment of each and that was it. Had we done more, we, we clearly would have counterbalanced. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's the end of this session. So thank you very much, everyone. And give us, <laughs> give a final round of applause. Bon appétit.